Okay, we are happy to have Oklahoma Labor Commissioner Leslie Osborne this morning, who was elected in 2018. And so I'm just going to turn it over to you. Okay, so um, I think I've spoken to this group before, but I, what I've been trying to do is educate people on what the Department of Labor does. And Lawrence had to hear this a few weeks ago, but he was gracious enough to give me this invitation. So if he gets bored and nods off, we'll know what it was. But um, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about what the Department of Labor does. We've gotten a lot of calls this year on, um, on unemployment in about half the states Lizzie, why don't you go ahead? Okay. So in about half the states, uh, the Employment Securities Commission is combined with the State Department of Labor. So they would have been handling all of these unemployment claims and all of the strange menagerie of things that came with COVID. But uh, in Oklahoma, those are totally separate, which is probably good for our agency because that's been a bit of a debacle. And um, so anyway, what we do do though, is so we are basically the safety agency for the state. We keep people safe. We work on safe workforces, safe places to work, but also things that citizens might take for granted that uh, we're checking for them. So uh, we check every commercial grade hot water heater and boiler across the state. And we do that because there was an explosion several years ago at Star Spencer schools where several people died. And then people said, well, why weren't people checking something like that? We check every uh, public access elevator and escalator in the state at least once a year, except for the city of Oklahoma City, which has their own jurisdiction. We check every um, establishment that does compressed natural gas vehicle conversions. Um, and we, uh, we're in charge of asbestos abatement projects to make sure that people use um, whenever asbestos is found, especially in commercial projects, to make sure that they're using uh, proper staffing and uh, safety measures for that, because that can be very serious. Um, and so it's just a lot of things that nobody would necessarily think about. But one of the things that I like to talk to all the chambers and rotaries about is our service that where we will go out with uh, OSHA trained employees to any business across the state and draw and help you implement a safety plan for your business at no cost. And there's only seven states that do that. It's a federal grant. It's not that widely utilized, but we've done it for years. So um, when you hear that OSHA has come into a business and basically fined or shut it down because it's not a safe workplace, uh, that's because most of these small mid-sized businesses can't afford to have a safety consultant. So what we have, and when I, when I say that OSHA does that, that's not us, that's the Federal Department of Labor. But what we have is OSHA trained employees, a division that will go out and if invited in, and, they, and the business decides to do that, they will basically embed themselves in your business, help you draw a safety plan, make sure that you're doing everything properly to keep your employees safe. Um, if you do that, you're also gonna get cheaper liability insurance. It's gonna be better for your workers' comp insurance. And if the federal government OSHA employees, which can stop in at any business in any state at any time, if they drop in and see that you're a part of our program, which we call the SHARP certification, they'll just walk away. And uh, so it's a, it's a double win because you're staying safer on that liability issue. But the main thing is you're keeping your employees safe. And where we notice it is in things, particularly in manufacturing type facilities, but we're also seeing it, and I'm getting ready to speak to a cannabis group. We're seeing a lot of those kind of businesses explode and grow. Well, a lot of those are fine, but if it's the ones where they're doing something with extractions, a lot of times there is um, there are caustic materials you might be breathing in. There's things that could explode load. There's things that you need to make sure you have enough, uh, you have proper exits and lighting and that you have, uh, you know, fire safety equipment and those types of things. So just know that if, if you know anyone that has that any type of business that might be interested in that to have them call our agency because we, uh, we do a lot of those across the state and they're very successful. The other thing we do is make sure that people are paid their wages. And uh, so anybody that, w that has taken a job at an Oklahoma business and then was not paid for it can come to us. What we, if you didn't have us, what you would have to do is, is hire a lawyer and go to district court, which can be very expensive. So we do that also at no cost. So a lot of the demographic we serve are people that probably couldn't afford to do the other option, but we will take any size case. And last year we brought in about a million dollars in... Uh, in 
and the average claim was 850 per person of people that had not been paid for a job. And we have administrative law judges come in and they secured those payments. And what I love about that division in particular is, of course, if anyone works for an Oklahoma business and isn't paid, that's not right, first of all. But second of all, the demographic we serve, a lot of times that's the difference in them not having their car repossessed or being evicted from their apartment, which can then start that downward spiral where you could see homelessness or it's hard to get the next job or those kind of things. So it's another great division and service that we provide at no cost to Oklahomans. We also do uh, occupational licensure. Uh, we license welders and locksmiths and several other professions. And as the, um, as the state labor commissioner, I get to chair the occupational licensing commission, which has been really interesting. We have 210 jobs in our state that require some form of occupational license. That's done through 42 different agencies, but we have one website, um, one data source on our website where you can go and click on any of those jobs and it will take you to the site. So say if it was the architects board, it'd take you to them and show you what it takes in Oklahoma to be an architect, what kind of continuing education, what do you have to do to license educational requirements, what would it cost? It's a great resource for things like high school counselors or for even for people that are considering a, a, a skills change or something to a different profession at some point in their life, just to see what we do and what are the requirements for different occupations in Oklahoma. So we have 80 employees, a small agency, a pretty small footprint, but a very worthy, I feel, agency that um, is probably overlooked because people don't really understand what we do. Um, so the other thing that I'd like to address real quick before we open it up for any questions is, uh, is that any speech I give, I've been ending or talking about the need to get back to civility in politics and government and how sorely lacking that has become in the last several years. When I ran for the House of Representatives, which I was in for 10 years before I ran for Labor Commissioner, prior to that, I was in the private sector selling heavy duty truck parts in Tuttle, Oklahoma, just a normal life, had never run for anything. And I was recruited by a friend that was in the Senate to run for an open house seat, but I ran my first term on bipartisanship, wanting to work in the middle for real solutions and take off the labels, Democrat, Republican, and let's just make sure that we're doing what we should as a legislature, which would be to expend taxpayer dollars for the core services of the state, which would be infrastructure, roads and bridges and schools and, uh, and mental health and all the things that you have to have to have a society. That was very well received at that time. But I can tell you now that if I went to one of my party meetings, and I think I could say the same thing if I was a Democrat and went to a party meeting, that would not be well received because people want you to hate the other party. They want you to hate the other side. They want you to think that every idea they have is toxic and that only your opinions and your party have the right answers. I, I totally disagree with that. I think some of the best legislation that I was ever a part of in the House of Representatives was when we would have consensus in the middle, working with all parties and listening to all sides and viewpoints. Um, and I think that it's really, a lot can be blamed on the national news cycle. A lot can be blamed on social media, uh, podcasts of people that are not experts, but sound like experts. And when you turn on the national news channels from Fox to MSNBC and you see these panels of people screaming angrily at each other and the accusations of what the other side is. And um, I just, I think that it's, it's disintegrating any civility and ability to work together for good solutions for public servants. And I think that um, it's something I wish that all of us would take the personal challenge to turn off the national news to stop listening to those types of pundits. Um, absolutely, we need to know, and I have the Apple News app on my phone that shows me everything from MSNBC to Fox to Newsmax to uh, Newsweek and will show me the headlines of the day. So I'm going to know if there was a typhoon in Thailand. I'm gonna know if North Korea is, is threatening to bomb South Korea but I don't need to hear that from a panel of so-called experts on TV that think how they think I should think. And I think that if we're really honest with ourselves, it's denigrating to our society and it bleeds down into our children. And I say a lot of times I have two grown children and I take more pride 
when I hear that they've been kind or philanthropic or good than when I hear that they're utilizing the four degrees they have between them. And I'm glad that they're successful in their, pri in their, in their work life, but I take a lot more pride on the kind of people I raised them to be. And I feel like we've gotten away from that. And when people, even our children see that type of rhetoric, it does bleed down. So I hope y'all will take that challenge with me to call out a friend or a family member if you see that they're the ugly keyboard warrior and, uh, and instead hope that we can get back to good solutions and perhaps get back to our legislature uh, working on the things they were meant to work on, which was the things of that fabric of society instead of trying to save our souls, uh, which I believe is the place of being in the pulpit on Sunday morning instead of trying to legislate that from the state capitol at 23rd and Lincoln. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Lori or to Jill or to Lawrence or whoever it might be and see if anybody might have any questions about what we do at the Department of Labor or anything else going on with state government. Thank you for sharing. And I've known you for a long time and I'm glad you still carry that same message. So thanks for sharing that again. I just wanted to know what role do you have during this COVID season um, helping with the labor and making sure they're safe and things like that? Is that still just something that stays at the legislature? Or well, one thing that's been real interesting, and you probably know him because you've been around the Capitol, the Stephen Buck, who used to run the Oklahoma Juvenile Authority, now runs what is the Oklahoma Nursing Home Association, but that's not the name of it. It's like care providers. Just a few weeks ago, he reached out to me and asked if we would be willing to come to their annual conference with that safety training program, those OSHA gentlemen that I talked about that we have and ladies in that division, and maybe give tips to the people in his industry. Uh, all of them are obviously watching a lot of what the CDC recommends, and that's what he said is their basic guideline in a healthcare type industry. But he wanted to know if we would come in and just maybe a little more boots on the ground, talk to them about, you know, really implementing that. So we've tried to offer those services. I get a lot of calls from people about, do I have to vaccinate? Uh, those types of things. In general, we don't get to make that determination. But what I do tell people is to be totally honest, we're a right to work state. And if anyone remembers when that passed on the ballot, which was prior to me coming into the legislature, that basically said that Oklahoma businesses didn't have to unionize, but it also said that they were quote, what I would call the boss, they can hire and fire at will. Not every state is a right to work state, but what that would mean is if, if I didn't like the way you looked, Lori, and you worked for me, I could say I was going to fire you because I didn't think that you looked like a Department of Labor employee. Well, that's insulting. First of all, you do look like one. You would fit in lovely in a, in a quite high position. But the point being, it's at will. So actually the employer does have that right in Oklahoma. It's different in every state according to that. Now, what people can do is claim exemptions. They can claim exemptions for different reasons. Now, does that mean that the employer has to keep them or does it mean it may end up litigated or going to the attorney general's office to the, you know, uh, that division, I'm not sure. That gets out of our purview, but what we've done is given quite a few recommendations to business owners, to employees, on um, safety with COVID. Now, have we been tasked by state government to do that? No. The state administration has been pretty hands-off on anything and kind of put that on personal responsibility. We hear the governor say that a lot as far as whether to vaccinate. And in fact, the legislature even went you know, a step further like several other states, red states in particular, that said you couldn't even mandate masks for children. You certainly couldn't mandate uh, COVID vaccinations. So, and it's interesting to me, and whether you are on the spectrum of being a believer in science and medicine and, and vaccines, which is probably what I've been raising my children. They got all the jabs as they call them now growing up. I did too. I'm lucky to not have ever had smallpox or polio, a lot of things because of that. So I was one that was anxious and waiting to vaccinate because I have a daughter that's immune compromised that I see quite a bit and I wanted to make sure I kept her safe. But um, it, what I was going to say at first is I do remember the first year I was in the legislature, we did have a bill that came up on vaccinations in schools. And at that time, only three Republicans voted out of 149 with what I would call the anti-vaxxers. 
This year, the Republican Party in Oklahoma in the legislature voted over 50% with the anti-vaxxers. So that's a big change in 12 years. So I don't know if that's kind of a mindset or if we're electing different people or if the world is evolving and people think different, but it's just kind of interesting for a barometer to see how much even our state has changed on opinions on those types of things. James, Tim, Lawrence, do you guys have any questions? I did, but Tim Tim seems to have beaten me to the to the mouth open. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, there we go. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. My my question would be regarding the the minimum wage law. Um, a lot of states have um, instituted their own minimum wage, uh, different, higher than than the federal. Um, I think some states have actually done it through referendums because um, the legislature wasn't moving on it. Um, has there been any conversation, any talk about moving up to a higher minimum wage than the federal? We do get quite a few queries about that as well. And I will tell you that I have studied the issue because it wasn't really in my purview before being labor commissioner. This is the longest we've ever gone in the United States without upping the minimum wage. And also by correlation with that, it's the longest that cost of living has not caught up with minimum wage. Now, obviously any, nobody is, we're all required for that as a minimum, but quite a few businesses that would have been what we called minimum wage businesses have taken that into their own hands and their own responsibility and raised wages. But I think it is something that needs to be addressed. I think it's something we do seriously need to look at because it is impossible to uh, survive probably with family and those kind of things. Now, the argument a lot of times will be, well, that was never meant to be your full-time job. You know, these types of jobs that are minimum wage jobs are more of a transitory job or a first job or while you're in college job or those kind of things. But at the end of the day, guys, there's a lot of those jobs. And there's a lot of Oklahomans and Americans that are struggling to survive on those wages. Um, and I think a lot of times I will see, you know, we have very low unemployment in Oklahoma. And I heard a friend the other day on Facebook put something about, well, obviously every fast food place I drive by has signs out we're hiring that everybody that used to work in these fast food stores must be laying home on their couches getting those uh, checks for COVID. And I really don't think that's true because our unemployment claims are down so much. I think it's that people have opted over the COVID break to perhaps uh, go back to the career tech to do something to find another job that did pay better. And I think it's going to end up being a supply and demand thing because the Oklahoma legislature and governor have made it quite clear that they're not interested in addressing it. So you're exactly right. A lot of those kind of things. And I do hate to see sometimes when the legislature, and I feel like I can talk about that since I was there, I can own a little bit of that, good or bad, in that we are <clears throat> very guilty of not wanting to address the difficult things because we're scared of our next election. So we didn't address, address medical marijuana. We didn't address Medicaid expansion. We didn't address a lot of the things that did come about later on a ballot with a referendum, like you said. Now, those have to be funded. You really can't do those anymore unless you have somebody philanthropically, a foundation, a person helping fund that because you have to have paid petition takers and those types of things. I think this is one that if we ever do change that in Oklahoma, as red as we are right now, it seems to, it shouldn't be a red blue issue. To me, it shouldn't be just like the vaccine shouldn't, but it's come down to a red blue issue. Daniel Pay is a very sharp young representative from uh, Lawton. I just love him. He's full of energy. He's young. He's excited. He has great ideas, and but he's reasonable, very reasonable. And every year he runs one of these bills and he's a Republican. And every year leadership just laughs at him. But I told him, you know, if that's what you feel that you really think we need to work on that, keep filing it. I, I ran the workers' comp reform bill, and it was the 12th year in a row it had been run, and we got it through. Is it because I was the best author in 12 years? No, it's probably because of the fatigue of the legislature. It's like, damn, do we have to hear that bill again? So I just happened to get it the year that it got through because it was a good idea and it needed to be done, but it was just that thing when you have a monumental change, it takes a while. These kind of things don't happen overnight. I don't see any interest at this point 
from the Oklahoma legislature, the governor, and even slightly considering it, but I would be in favor of that type of conversation. I had two questions. One would be, what is your engagement with your agency and others in the state when it comes to, as you said, um, at-will employment? In some states, right to work is literally just the union, non-union part. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're at will, I've heard business owners make the comment, well, I can fire anybody for any reason. That's not really true. Right. If it's something that violates federal labor laws. So what, is that, what does that really mean that I can fire somebody for any reason? I can fire somebody or choose not to hire somebody, which I think is the part that gets left out of this discussion sometimes. But let's, uh, I don't think anybody here owns or has an interest in Twin Peaks. So let's just do that. Wait staff at Twin Peaks have a very specific, let's call it body type, uh, kind of like Hooters. So if somebody comes in, that, that does seem to be a, I've made a decision on how I'm going to hire or terminate somebody that isn't protected by religion, race, disability. So if somebody comes with an argument that's outside of those specific things, is there just kind of nothing that's done? And if it is a legitimate argument under federal law, do they just go to the Department of Labor and, and they leave you guys out of it? How does that work? So what I would say on that is it's a gray area. To be totally honest, we get in a very murky area when you get into that because the predominant amount of, of employers that might not hire somebody or might fire somebody for the type of reason you're talking about is probably savvy enough that they're not giving that as the reason. Okay. So, you know, what can you document is would be the first thing. We refer quite a few people to the attorney general's office on the EEOC, which obviously would be if somebody was doing that because of sexual orientation, because of age, because of race, because of those types of things. And they do um, actively pursue those types of things. Other than that, um, I usually unfortunately it falls out of our purview to have jurisdiction on it if it's not paying the wages. But I will say that I do recommend to most people is, is anybody that owns a business. And so this could go either way, but anybody that owns a business should hire somebody that's familiar with actual labor law, not just the guy that draws your wills and all that. You really need to have a labor law lawyer update your manual at least once a year, even going into things like the medical marijuana question and what are safety sensitive jobs that there, we had this problem before with people that might have a long-term back condition and take a small amount of opioids. It was no different with that than it is with somebody that might be smoking medical marijuana. However, those are the kind of things that would end up being addressed usually in district court and usually um, that's how it's done on anything like that. And of course, if you're a business owner, the best thing you can do is be very specific and updating in your manual. But if you're an employee, to be honest, a lot of times you're thrown into that gray area where can you afford to litigate? Do I go to the Federal Department of Labor, the State Department of Labor? Do I go to the Attorney General's office? Do I, do I go to the Employment Securities Commission? And to be honest, it's pretty vague. So we get a lot of, of questions and we send them to the proper authorities and the same way they send them back to us. But I wish I could give you a clear cut answer that this is exactly where you should go or what you should do if you've had that type. If it's not something that's not addressed by the Attorney General's office, it does get gray. Okay. My second question um, kind of plays off something that you had said about the, the, the House and the Senate. Uh, Greg Tree recently was quoted as saying that perhaps letting people make decisions isn't necessarily the best way. Um, and so there's been supportive legislation to make those state questions simply harder. Um, this is less of a what your current job is and more about your bigger picture ideas. When we find that disconnect because hmm, this is a, an election season is coming and I don't know which way the people that vote for me are gonna go. Is there a way around that, Leslie, where we can, clearly for me, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between the folks that we send to 23rd and Lincoln to do the will of the people and then what the will of the people 
is. It's like those minorities are controlling the majority. Any comment on that in general? I can rephrase if it helps. Um, when we pass state questions, they pass with 60 or 70%. The majority of elected officials after the fact say, yeah, that was, that was a good idea, but we really wanted to hear from the people. But these are the same people that are telling their elected officials, please do this. And then right. they don't act on it. I wish I could tell you that there was a simple solution for that, but it's 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 people that are scared of the next ballot box. And that's in both parties. That's everywhere. It's not just Oklahoma. But at the end of the day, Oklahoma is a pretty populous state is what I would say. And it's always um, it's surprised me always how successful many of these state questions can be. And it's basically a way to bypass the legislature not taking up an issue you think they should have. In general, the ones that pass are ones that we've been hearing about for years. So I'm going to use Medicaid expansion again and um, medical marijuana. Both of those came up yearly, year after year after year, and we refused to address them because we were afraid it wouldn't fit with what Am I still doing okay, Lori? You froze for a few seconds. <laughs> okay. So I do think, that's what it came up and said it, so I thought so. But um, I will say that there's not a lot we can do about that to change anything except to be sure about who we're sending to be our representatives. And the accountability of if you notice that they're one that is oh so cautious, oh so scared, then it may be time for a new representative or senator. I mean, we we get sent there to to address the easy issues and the tough issues. And if you're not willing to do both, I don't really have a lot of use for that. And I think we need to be listening to our constituents. And sometimes the majority of constituents may have a different opinion than we do. And we have to listen to that if we're truly what we would call a representative. And um, that's a difficult journey because most people, when they get there, want to be reelected. Not all are that way. Many of them will take bold stands in both parties. But the only way we're going to get away from that is who we're putting into the legislature that's willing to take on big ticket issues without fear of not being reelected. And, you know, my consultant gets on to me quite frequently because I'm rather verbose about my opinions on working together in the middle or that I have a gay daughter and that I'm very against LGBT uh, type legislation. She just wants to be treated the same as everyone else. And I, I will talk a lot about those kind of things. He's like, oh, it makes you so hard to elect. And I say, okay, I have no problem with that. And when at the ballot box, they don't send me back, I'll know you were right. But at this point, I'm going to keep saying, and I'm going to keep doing it the way I've done it. And knock on wood, I've been elected six times by being very forthright. I don't have time for political games. And I just didn't come there to do that. And you'll never see me at a lector and say something I don't truly believe. I see people elected to Congress that start immediately talking about the wall or talking about whatever. It's like, I never heard them talk about that before they got there. Is that like talking points for the, you know, you know, that you have to do that. I don't get that. My point is you need to be who you are. You need to represent who your people are. And at the end of the day, we've gotten pretty far away from that, be totally honest. Hey, I'd like to hop in if I can. Yeah, um, go ahead. So I, a couple of questions. One of them uh, kind of bouncing off of, of what you were talking about with the safety plan, right? Um, we do have an OSHA uh, specialist on our staff, but I'm not sure if we have, you know, the, the formalized safety plan and things like that. Uh, and just to touch a background, I'm with Dale Rogers Training Center. Uh, we have kind of a warehouse production area, production center area, uh, where something like this would definitely fit in, I think. Is it best to do that safety plan or to, to have that consultation uh, when staff are present or when they're not present? I think the best thing would be to meet with management. And per so for instance, if you all call this and you do have a staff member that does that, I think it'd be great if he and leadership actually met directly with the gentleman that comes out for us, the head of that division and see where you are, because it's not necessarily that you want to spot check that they're doing everything right. Uh, but I think it would just be having that added, um, 
tutelage or added to make sure that there aren't some newer, because our guys and, and gals uh, do have to go every year for a pretty extensive training with OSHA every year for any kind of new federal mandates to whatever that is. Even though we're a state agency, they're training what is required on that federal level. And I think it would be very beneficial. And um, Lori and Lawrence both have my contact information. I'd love to set you up with our uh, person that comes out to do that because um, sometimes something slips through the cracks. Sometimes there's something new that you're not aware of. Sometimes you need a fresh set of eyes to come in. And like I, I use Boeing all the time, but Boeing probably has a fleet of safety consultants. But you know, a lot of times a smaller business that pops up and comes up and grows exponentially will not have caught up with that or be able to afford that. And we fit that niche very well. So uh, we would love to visit with you if there was, and like I said, no cost and no obligation, and we never report anything to the federal government. So a lot of times people would say like, well, is this going to be expensive? And are you going to turn us in if we're doing something? No, we're not. We don't, we have no ability and no desire to do that. We just want to help people do things better for their employees. Awesome. And, and Lawrence and Lori, I would definitely take, take her information as well. So okay. get offline here. We can, we can hash that out. Uh, my other question is, I'm glad you kind of touched on it too, is, is, is communicating with the fed federal level, right? Uh, so as a nonprofit agency, we provide training and jobs for people with disabilities uh, on the main campus. And uh, really, 14C is a huge issue for us, and it's coming down the pike. And it seems uh, like this year it's really picking up a lot of ste steam with phasing out subminimum wage. Um, have you had any talks at that level, any kind of indication off nothing just shaking the we head we have been i'll be totally honest it's kind of like when people say to me what's governor sticking and i said well i don't know i haven't really visited with him since the day we were all inaugurated on this on the steps of the capitol so i mean sometimes agencies work real well together sometimes state elected officials work well together and sometimes you have more of that independence where it's kind of like you you take care of your lane and i'll take care of my lane i'll see you in four years at the next ballot box in oklahoma that's kind of how we are now we all are very independent and have very little collaboration which was surprising to me there's nothing wrong with that it's just a style of leadership but i know for instance when fallon was in the um was governor, we used, they used to have quarterly meetings with all the statewide electeds and work on initiatives together. We do none of that. We also get very little input from the federal government of what they're going to do on those things. To be totally honest, we get it in a newsletter about the same time you do. So I wish I could tell you that we had some uh, secret bat phone you know, are you too, are you old enough for that reference, the bat phone, you know, that with the red phone that would ring and we got like the early notice? No, unfortunately we don't. But if it ever does happen, I'll let you know. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. We don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing with us about the Oklahoma Labor Commissioner and Labor Department. And so uh, anyway, thank you guys so much and look for um, news about the next Northwest Now soon coming to you in your email. Thank you.